Um, it's 1 p.m. on the East Coast, and as always, we'll get our call started on time. So everyone's now on mute, but when the time comes for questions or comments, I'll tell you how to request unmuting so we can call on you. My name is Azer Cole. I'm one of two citizen empowerment coordinators here at American Promise. Well, boy, Gather is the other one. We'll hear from her later on in the call. And welcome to the American Promise National Citizen Leader Call for April 2018, a call that happens on the second Saturday of each month. And thanks to all of you who've taken the time out of your busy weekends to join us today, or maybe you couldn't make it live and you're listening to this recording afterwards, but either way, you're stepping up to save our democracy, so a huge thank you to all of you. We're honored to have two incredible guest speakers here today, John Pudner, Executive Director of Take Back Our Republic, and Steve Lipscomb, founder of Fix It America. And on recent calls, we've had award-winning author Francis Moore LePay talking about channeling feelings of hopelessness into empowerment and action. We heard from Minnesota Democratic Congressman Rick Nolan talk all about current congressional bills, bills that have more than 160 Democratic co-sponsors, but only one Republican co-sponsor. And that's why this work is so vital especially the work to bring Republicans on board. And this month, we're going to build on those insights, focusing on how to work effectively with Republicans and on the great Republican support we've already seen at the state and local level. A constitutional amendment isn't something that one party can do on its own, and this is how we're going to win. And as always, be thinking of questions to ask for our guest speakers when we get to the question and answer section. And after hearing from John Pudner and Steve Lipscomb, we'll hear a grassroots victory from a dynamic citizen leader, Chip Cooper, in St. Louis, Missouri. We'll talk about this month's action, writing letters to the editor using the Government of Citizens Not Money report as a powerful tie-in. And we'll finish up the call by teaching a laser talk on the Government of Citizens Not Money report so we're able to effectively speak to the need for cross-partisan solutions and show people that there is, in fact, growing cross-partisan support. So thanks everyone who's stepping up. And if you're interested in learning more about what it takes to start an American Promise Association in your community, please send me an email at azerc at americanpromise.net. That's A-Z-O-R-C as in cat at americanpromise.net. And I just wanted to start by sharing this quote from Alice Paul, a feminist leader of the 19th Amendment movement. And, and she said, I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, not problems, are complicated. But to me, there's nothing complicated about ordinary equality. I'm going to repeat that. I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated. But to me, there's nothing complicated about ordinary equality. And, and I think most people are here on this call because they have some clarity that there's something wrong with the way our government is functioning. You know, money is not the same thing as speaking. Corporations are not the same thing as a person. And we're going to do something about it to fix things. So with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Jeff Clements, American Promise founder and president Hey, Jeff. How are you? I'm well, Azer. How are you doing? And hello doing to everybody really well. on, the, on the call. Thanks to Steve and, and John for joining us. We'll hear from them in just a second. But before we do, I just want to um, put what we're doing today in, in a bit of context. As, as uh, people who've been working on this know, and as probably every American knows, Congress isn't going to wake up one day, uh, sing Kumbaya, come together and pass this amendment uh, to get big money under control and get people represented uh, because uh, by two thirds uh, across the aisle, because they have a sudden change of heart about the bitter divides. It's going to happen because all of you and Americans come together across partisan differences, across ge geographic and cultural differences, all sorts of differences to say, look, we've got to do this for America and for our future, and we're going to do it together. And and that's exactly what's happening. I want to give a big shout out to the citizen leaders in Wisconsin united to amend nine more cities, towns, and counties in Wisconsin voted a week or two ago uh, for 28th Amendment uh, ballot initiatives in their communities. 
they all passed, nine of them. The lowest uh, was 77% approval. The average was 81% approval. And these are red, blue, and in between towns. Um, this, Americans are together on this. And now our job is to get uh, Congress to actually reflect the cross-partisan support and the urgent demand for this constitutional amendment. We're going to do two things, at least today, um, that will help you help them to do the right thing to, uh, to uh, get together on this amendment, get it out to the states for ratification. The first thing is uh, we've told you about leading up to this call about our Government of Citizens report. It's a remarkable document that we were really pleased to join with uh, Fix It America and Take Back Our Republic, John and Steve, to release this together because it shows the depth of cross-partisan support in America and identifies more than 200 Republican lawmakers in the states and national Republicans who have raised their hand to say, yes, we need this constitutional amendment. And of course, many Democrats and independents have done that as well, but we're, we're showing the, uh, the myth that somehow this is just a liberal issue or just a issue of one party or another. This is uh, something that all of the parties can come together on. So that report's gonna be very useful. We'll say a little bit more about it and how we can use it most effectively. The other thing though we continue to do is walk the walk. Um, you know, John Pudner and Steve and I and all of you come from very different political backgrounds and views and yet we're together on this. We're so proud to have uh, and say announce uh, earlier this week, or, I'm sorry, later next week, you're getting a, a sneak preview here of our new advisory council members and, and Steve Lipscomb, who you're gonna hear from in a minute, is, uh, is going to join our advisory council and join John Pudner and many others across the political spectrum on that advisory council. And we're really uh, thrilled to share with you the news before we share it publicly next week that Senator Olympia Snow, the former Republican U.S. Senator from Maine, known for her cross-partisan uh, work to get things done, will also be joining Steve and John and others on our advisory council. So both the way American Promise walks the walk and all of you walk the walk, and then this kind of report is going to help us all to get the message out and deliver the message loud and clear to Congress that we're coming together across our divides to get this done. You need to do that too. So uh, that's the game plan. And uh, let me turn it over to hear more about how we can execute that game plan. And, and everyone will be happy to answer your questions as well. Uh, to our speakers, our first guest speaker today, many of you know John, he's been on our calls before. He's been at our conference. John Pudner is the executive director of Take Back Our Republic, an organization fighting for government of the people, by the people, and for the people, rather than beholden to big business and union influence. John is a well-known uh, conservative uh, campaign leader uh, over three decades, and most famously uh, led uh, um, a, a, a challenge in the Republican primary for his candidate to unseat U.S. Majority Leader Eric Cantor galvanizing a grassroots base to achieve a remarkable political upset that largely turned on whether uh, he was and others are representing the people or representing the lobbyists. And so we're very glad to have John join us today. Our second guest, as I said, is Steve Lipscomb, uh, who has uh, followed a uh, successful and extraordinary career in business uh, to, like many other Americans, roll up his sleeves to say, look, the country's in trouble. I can do something. I'm going to do something. And he built Fix It America, a organization that's um, leading uh, and advocating for a 28th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution alongside all of us to end legalized corruption, get the people represented, and stop the partisan gerrymandering that, that keeps uh, politicians picking their voters rather than voters picking their politicians. So we're so thrilled to have both you, of you here, Steve and John, and uh, we'll look forward to sharing um, news from you, uh, news about the report and how we can best use it. And just before I turn it over to you, let me just give you an idea of the kind of people on this call. They're remarkable American Promise citizen leaders, as well as people new to this work, uh, just learning more. But we have Laura Nipmeyer and members of her American Promise Association in Montclair, New Jersey, who recently had an extended meeting with their uh, congressman, Representative Leonard Lance, a Republican. 
And Vicki Barnes and one of her team members discussed the 28th Amendment um, with uh, Representative Eric Paulson, another Republican in Minnesota. So uh, these folks are ready to uh, take what uh, lessons learned, to share them, and to build that cross-partisan support. I also want to give a big shout out to Ellen Green Bush, who I saw in Columbus, Ohio this past week, and she is helping to build the Port Clinton, Ohio American Promise Association and recently met with one of Republican Senator Rob Portman's staff members and have been also meeting with their Republican state legislator, Stephen Arndt, as well. So these meetings are happening all across the country because American Promise members are stepping up to do the hard work. And I know we are all looking forward to your thoughts and your advice, uh, John, and why don't you take it away first and then you can uh, introduce Steve as well. So go ahead, John, thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you and uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity. I mean, just a fantastic group and uh, having done years of politics, um, as I was getting into the, making this transition a few years ago, I wanted to look for groups that really could put people together for meetings I could really see were legit. And I quickly discovered, you know, American Promise was right at the top. I mean, I'll just have fantastic events all over the country and, and that's hard to pull off. It, it, it says something about the messaging and how people are engaged and how important this issue is to everyone. So um, appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes on three different Areas one is just is the the publication the government of of citizens not money, and how important I think that is to perhaps cross partisan languaging and uh, as you talk to people. Secondly, I want to talk about kind of the the type of interactions with legislators to when you uh, um, you get to that level. Um, you know, they're different tips, but I've got a couple of perspectives on things that might be helpful. And then third, I just want to run through a few states where we've kind of made, made a first attempt here, and, I, and I'll close with New Mexico to, to turn it over to Steve Lipscomb. So that's, that's my basic one, two, three flow here. Um, first off, the, the government of citizens, not money. Um, I, I really do encourage everyone to go through that. We were really happy with how that came together. And, you know, the term cross-partisan, and I know people kick around different terms, transpartisan, different things. Cross-partisan, it's just so important to really get that and to buy into the fact that you can reach people across the aisle, no matter where you are ideologically. Um, everything that we're presented with on TV and everywhere else kind of presents this. Republicans are all in lockstep on one side, Democrats on the other. They fight with each other. Anyone who's run campaigns will... Uh, you know, over a drink at night, compare notes on how much nastier internal party politics is than any of the stuff between the parties you see on TV. So there are opportunities. And I use the word nasty. I mean, it just, it gets vicious. And you do have people that, of course, are in absolute lockstep with the big money leadership, you know, um, that would want to dominate both parties. Um, and, uh, and and to realize that, that there are people within parties and that cross-partisan, it can mean in some cases actually having an independent candidate who's outside the party structure or a third-party candidate. But at other times, it can just be that challenge to the party from within, you know, which, of course, the the Dave Brad over Canada race we mentioned I was involved in. But there, there are a bunch of those. The, you know, there's one Congressman Jones down in North Carolina who really fights to put in campaign finance reform stuff, and he's certainly a very distinct um, minority among the Republican caucus. But but you go state by state, and you start seeing a lot more of this among state legislators. It's not just kind of three or four members of Congress. It's it's a bigger group, and um, and and I think the language is very helpful. And there's an appendix of Republicans who do support campaign finance reform. So I just that document really is helpful, and I just encourage anyone to go through it, among other things, of course, as you're preparing to go to a legislate, uh, legislature for the first time, um, or or even if you've done it in the past. I think get some extra tips. Um, so uh, secondly, I just want to talk a little about the, the type of interactions. Now that we've had a chance to go to a few different um, legislatures, get a feel, um, uh, you know, the first thing is just try to go in thinking of every legislator with, um, you're going to talk to as a friend at a starting point. I mean, make that the, um, uh, you know, make that the default. <laughs> they, they will sometimes prove otherwise, and you have to adjust. But no matter what the last battle was, yeah, another thing I just learned from political years, there were so many times that in one year, suddenly 
you know, my worst enemy for the past campaign became my best ally. And this will sometimes happen even in legislative battles. And sometimes we're predisposed because we fought someone on another issue unrelated to, to write off that person. And you, you can sometimes find that, you know, a real social conservative is actually very concerned that gambling money has become the big thing in a state, just to take, you know, kind of an, an, an odd example. So maybe you're fighting someone on one issue, but you find, wow, they really are concerned about money. I wouldn't have thought about that person as an ally, you know, a, a li- more libertarian oriented, just no government at all that, you know, they will sometimes start predisposed against this until you talk about government picking winners and losers based on campaign contributions. So, you know, they're different angles and we segment, we have a whole segment of if their background is this, here's the first paragraph you say to them. <laughs> and, um, so just go in thinking everyone may be a friend. Um, and uh, of course, once you find someone is not, um, then you need to adjust. And, and the next part of that is uh, I always organize based on Aristotle's basic principle, which is there people are in one of five places. E- each of these legislators will be in one of five places. Typically, you can only move someone one step. And so that's all you should try to do. If you do damage, try and do more. And I say it because if someone is on the worst step of the five, which is they not only want to vote against this, but they want to work against it and stop it, often your only goal there is to convince that person this is okay. It's not that big a deal. Hey, okay, you may not vote for it in the end. But sometimes just talking someone off being active into just passively voting no is actually a huge victory, uh, particularly if they're on a committee that has to – has to pass this and every legislature is different on their process. But then secondly, if they're just planning on voting against you, you know, sometimes you can get these guys to actually take a pass. Just look, is the vote really that important to you? I mean, a lot of committee votes, um, uh, for those of you who have to go through a committee on one of these, um, uh, which isn't always the case, they're often won by someone just saying, you know, it's not that bad. I don't really want to be on record for it. I couldn't vote for it, but you know, I've got another meeting that day I can go to. So that can be a victory or, um, and if, or conversely, if they were going to take a pass, trying to convince them just to vote yes. You know, so obviously everyone thinks about this broad middle, kind of that third category where there is at least open mindedness and trying to convince them. Of course, that's a big part, but it's only one of, you know, only one of them. And then the last mistake people make is someone's already voting for them, they don't talk to them anymore. And if someone's already with you when you get there, which is always a nice, pleasant surprise sometimes to have a plan on what you're going to ask them to do. I mean, you may only, you, you may get them for a few minutes and not realize this person will be hard to get to for the next three weeks. I've got to have an ask ready. And, you know, are there six other legislators they can talk to? Or do I want to try to get a, a sentence from them? Do I want to have it ready on the spot? To say, hey, do, would you mind doing a quote here that I could put in a little paper as I go around and, and see? So try to get them from just a vote yes to a actual activist. So you're always trying to move people one step along, uh, you know, along this thing. And yes, and on the enemy front, just jump back to that. One important thing there is just not to poke the hornet's nest. You know, we really want to win over people and show them their arguments are wrong and, and show that, of course, we have the better arguments in favor of a 28th Amendment. But you don't want to berate someone and remind them you're there. Part of getting them not active is sometimes just not being present. Just like in campaigns, we our strongest lecture was don't go knock on the doors of all the people who are going to vote against you if they remember to vote. I mean, you you need to – you need to use some tact. You don't want to. Uh, you may need to confront them in a committee meeting because there's a hearing, but you you don't really want to even be walking down their hall. You you you'd be happy if they felt like this thing is dead and has no chance, and they don't have to do anything about it. That's one way to make someone more passive. So just think of those approaches, and then just lastly, how they've applied to the few states we've been um, we've gotten to go through or starting into now. Um, we actually made a pretty good run in Alabama. Looked like we might be able to sneak something through the last couple of weeks. I purposely waited till toward the end because I didn't want to draw the early fire. Back to that last point. And, you know, we got a Republican sponsor in the House. The Senate actually had me as their weekly lunchtime speaker to lay out why we should do this. And we were in particular showing the Fixed America um, Amendment, you know, one of the ways we go about this a 28th Amendment. So I got to do a whole presentation. I mean, they, they have one person a week present. 
Um, it was in the final week. There definitely was some some pushback from one senator who's leaving. But my gosh, you know, I think uh, not eight different people over the course of the session got to address the the Senate lunch meeting, and I was one of them. And this issue was one of the eight that they thought started thinking about. So we're going to take a real shot next year in Alabama. It was great progress. Uh, Virginia, the person who actually ran the second half of Dave Bratt's race, his general election, was then elected a state senator. She formed a transparency caucus in Virginia as, as a Republican senator. And she, to show how cross-partisan she is, even though she's very conservative, um, she formed that, wanted to have a Democrat House member as the co-chair. And they've done things like required that all committee meetings now be videotapes. They can't vote in silent, things like that. So this logically flows from those kind of good government things. And the interesting thing, you may say, well, of course, you'd want someone from the other party, the other chamber. She did that, even though at the time, two years ago, the House had 68 Republicans and 32 Democrats. And she said, I want one of the 32 Democrats as my co-chair. Now, she looked in the future very well because the Democrats almost took control. So now that looks very smart. But we're having lunch to, for her to really talk about if she can press you know, a 28th Amendment. And you know, it's going to take a tough lunch, don't get me wrong, but – this is progress. Ohio, um, that's the one place Republicans really have thrown out their own redistricting plan. So if they open redistricting, which is something Steve and I both care about too, then you know certainly we think there's a chance on campaign finance and some of the Kasich versus Trump divisions there create opportunities. Um, unfortunately, their speaker just had an FBI raid, and we were yeah, so luckily they had him before we went and met with him. So we're going to meet with a new speaker in the weeks ahead. But so Ohio thinks real plan. And then New Mexico, of course, was the, the big victory to date. Um, you know, I'd say I just played a, a small role there, but sometimes people call us in and we're able to just go talk to the Republicans, have some credibility, add a little credibility, to some Republicans. In this case, that we're already thinking about um, supporting fix it, but it was just nice for them to have someone come in and so with that, because New Mexico is a great victory, and I don't want to for a second steal credit for Steve Lipscomb, who really championed that. I just played a bit role. I think that's a good transitional place to turn things over to Steve. Um, thank you, uh, John. The, uh, believe me, it's all about coalition building. Uh, my mother uh, always used to say, when in doubt, do something, which uh, is really what excites me about American Promise, Take Back Our Republic, um, Common Cause, and other organizations that we're currently working with, and that is um, doing something. Um, this is what I do every day, and it's because I believe we can pull it off, and uh, I'm not really willing to spend time on things that I don't think we can do. So, um, thank you, Jeff, for uh, inviting me to come and talk to people. But, you know, mostly thanks to everybody on the phone for actually waking up, uh, rolling up your sleeves, and taking a shot at uh, actually making this change. Um, it's one of those rare, rare issues that depending on which, uh, which survey or which study you want to look at, 86 to 92 percent of us already agree that it's a problem. So tangible solutions are the things that we're looking for. And I think uh, as we've been spending about two and a half years now and are working with uh, American Promise, Take Back Our Republic and others to really find that place where we intersect. And while we may spend the rest of the Republic trying to figure out all the details of how things change, similar to the way we do with the terms due process and equal protection, um, I firmly believe that there is this bipartisan, transpartisan, whatever term you'd like to use, desire for us to believe that fairness is not partisan. Um, and I think that's reflected over and over again as people call at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level, and while it's true that uh, perhaps some of those that legislation that Jeff referred to predominantly having Democrats, um, since Citizens United was passed, there have been a number of efforts by Republicans uh, in Congress to bring uh, something that would address dark money and or other parts of, uh, of what we're struggling to make sure a self-selected class of literally a 
a handful, uh, you know, less than a hundred people help determine what happens in our country. That really is a, uh, a belief that, that I uh, have found. And now with the rubber on the road, as John started to mention, the first place that we took the Fix It America constitutional amendment was in New Mexico. A conventional wisdom here, like most places, is it's a marathon, not a sprint. That's always good to believe. Otherwise, you tire yourself out. But really, to the shock and amazement of um, everyone here, some of whom have been working for decades on these issues, the first time we brought this uh, into the legislature, it passed with a resolution asking the delegation from New Mexico in Congress to take something very specific, the language of this amendment, please pass it and send it back to us because we are ready to ratify um, this language. Um, that to me is, uh, is sort of the quest and that is for us all together like we're doing today to find the places we can agree move forward, actually pass something, and then go to the next stage, which is now each, uh, each legislative session, people are going to try to figure out what it means to be transparent, what it means to avoid corruption, and what it means to do uh, to not allow people to buy uh, influence from representatives. Uh, the uh, the, one of the, one of the uh, things that we encountered, and I'm going to get a little bit into the weeds, but not very far. I echo all of the suggestions for sitting down and spending some time with uh, the government of the citizens report. Um, but I'm going to tell you what it is that we seem to be encountering as uh, the first line of defense from people who would rather not have this move forward. Um, and that really is a... Uh, notion of this abridging First Amendment freedom of speech rights and materials that we're certainly happy to supply um, and that I'm sure American Promise would be happy to help get to you um, really help us uh, redefine that notion for legislators um, as they look at it to understand that the idea that uh, that money is speech is not just relatively new, it's entirely new. Um, it wasn't until 20 years ago, uh, in, and you should come to know these cases pretty well, all of this is in the report, but Buckley v. Vallejo is the case where that was first brought into the lexicon of discussion about how we deal with money in elections. That's just 20 years ago. Prior to that, it was absolutely understood that it was in the purview of state and federal legis uh, legislation, legislators and legisl uh, legislatures. Thank you for that. <laughs> it was within their purview to actually uh, uh, pass laws that would try to keep integrity in the system. And it was only eight years ago that the Citizens United case really extended that so the flood of dark money is coming in. When legislators uh, left and right sort of get that right up front, they look at it differently. And we managed to change uh, some real opinions here, including one guy who was a legislator and had uh, been a First Amendment rights lawyer for over 20 years. Um, he gave his vote and on the floor of the, uh, of the House of Representatives in New Mexico said, um, we, you know, this is troubling to me that we're doing anything in the First Amendment world, but the Supreme Court has really left us no choice. Um, and so I don't want to go on and on. I know there will be questions to go, but I'm extremely excited to be partnered with American Promise, Take Back Our Republic and others to do the real stuff, which is state by state. We are building consensus by having legislatures uh, send their representatives to Congress uh, with a message that we have something tangible we would like them to do, not sort of a broad uh, anti-money message, but here's something 
uh, that we'd like you to pass. So with that, Jeff, I'm going to uh, pass it on back to you. And thanks, everybody, for caring about the country and working every day. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you, John. I'm going to fire it right back to Azer to manage some Q&A so we can bring, bring folks in now. Take it away, Azer. Great, everyone. So if you've got a question, go ahead and press 1. Go ahead and press 1 on your keypad so I know to call on you. And when I do, just go ahead and let us know where you're calling in from and uh, ask your question. Um, it looks like Craig Clevidence has his hand up. Craig, I'm going to call on you. Where are you calling in from? And what's your question? Hi, Azor. Uh, I'm uh, calling from Kalispell, Montana. I'm the director of Renew Democracy. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to Steve and John. Um, the uh, question that I would have is I wonder if I could get a commitment from, uh, and I know you both have some authorship of the Fix It America uh, uh, Amendment proposal. I wonder if I could get a commitment from you guys to have a discussion uh, about that proposal policy, um, uh, preferably on the AP Connect forum. Uh, always happy to talk to uh, anyone who wants to discuss that. I can tell you that American Promise is, um, as you I'm sure are aware, uh, go in the process of a, uh, of having community discussions around what a 28th Amendment can and should be. I'm more than happy to do that separately and or Jeff, if you want to uh, run that through your process, I'm fine with that too. Yeah, and thank, thanks, Steve, and thank you, Craig. Craig has been a part of that process. I hope continues to be a part of that process, especially as we move out his way in Denver. Uh, and Craig has some very interesting policy ideas and good thinking on this. So I, I hope you guys can connect at some point, maybe at the conference or if um, on the phone. But uh, thanks, Craig. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. All right. Thanks for that question, Craig. Um, I am going to now turn it over to one second here. Let's go to uh, Rich McKinney. Hey, Rich, you're unmuted. Where are you calling in from, and what's your question? Hi there, Rich McKinney. I'm from, um, and um, I would, so so I wrote a blog post probably about four or five years ago that, that follows in on this, and, and I would propose that you guys can use my, my line of logic, and that goes that, what is the moral authority for an elected representative to sit in that seat and pass a vote? I contend that his moral authority to pass a vote is his representation of the voters of his district. So if you propose that to someone, it's difficult for them to argue that that's not true. Then you take that to the next step. So is the government of Russia a citizen in your district? Is, um, you know, Google.com a citizen in your district? Is the UAW a citizen in your district? If that's not true, why should they have the authority or the moral capability to influence your election? It is somebody with big money in California, uh, should they be able to influence an election in Iowa? They're not. Thank, thanks so much for the question, Rich. In the interest of time, I'll, I'll pose that to the guest speakers, and I think we've got time for about one more question. So thanks, Rich. Does anyone have any comments on sort of that line of reasoning, which I think is a really powerful one? I think it's very powerful because I think what you're logically drawing them to, Rich, is you know, are we already in an oligarchy? I mean, if the real constituency that wins elections is how many of these out-of-state or out-of-country, as you mentioned, uh, donors give to you, 
and through bots and everything else, you win elections. Well, then we we have a government that there, really, in theory, is an oligarchy. I mean, that's the question we're at. Are we at that point? Are we trying to avoid that point? But but I think it's a great line of argument. We'd certainly love to incorporate. The, would like love to see the actual blog and incorporate into some of our writings too. I would great. add this, and it goes back to John's uh, notion of positive, and I think Jeff and John both referred to that, but. Um, honestly, it, uh, the, one of the things I think we can do wrong and uh, anyone can do wrong in a state is walking in to confront, like John said, the legislators rather than going in and literally the top of uh, the sheets that we left behind for legislators here in New Mexico. The first line was that this is the only 2018 legislation that offers a 40 percent time rebate. And it was appealing to the notion that these guys spend all that time raising money and they hate it. And uh, I have yet to find any sort of attempt to, uh, to uh, as John said, sway people. If, they're, if they believe corporations and unions have the right, um, or uh, literally people from California have the right, and that's freedom of speech, then trying to talk them out of it has not, and I haven't seen it work. On the other hand, it stinks to raise money. And they're the most uh, assailed people by this system. If we take that approach, they seem to really like us. They seem to think, yeah, man, I really want to do something about it, and I'd like to help you advance the ball. Great. Thanks, you guys. We've got time for uh, one more question or comment, and I'm just going to call on a phenomenal um, citizen leader, Vicki Barnes. Hey, Vicki, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, but where are you calling in from? And, and real quickly, uh, what have you been getting up to, and do you have any questions for uh, John or Steve? Um, thanks, Azer. Hi, I'm in St. Paul, uh, but I'm working in greater Minnesota, which is our outstate. Uh, we're not allowed to call it that anymore, so they're greater Minnesota, uh, which uh, the rural-urban divide was really pumped up after the 2016 election. And uh, thank you very much, Steve and John, for being on this call. Uh, so when we're working out in Greater Minnesota, I'm working with Take Back Our Republic. Uh, they're they're co-sponsoring events that we hold out there, and um, that's gone over really well. Uh, we've got four counties that have passed or working on or have passed resolutions calling on an amendment, and uh, we're in about 12 cities we're working in. Two of them so far um, have passed resolutions. And, um, and it's always unanimous, so that's pretty cool. Um, my question actually would be uh, to either one of you, and this is really uh, kind of shocks me so much I can't really respond very well. Um, I have uh, presented the resolution to both the, um, the leader of the Minnesota State Senate uh, um, administrative aide as, and also to Congressman Eric Paulson in a way that I say, oh, this is what we've got. We're working on. Can you see any reason why you would object to this? Uh, just to kind of get a feel for where they stand. And both of them looked at the bill, both the federal legislation and the, um, the state legislation, and said it's a Democrat bill. Hmm. So when I hear that, it's kind of hard to convince them otherwise uh, because there's such a party divide. And when we're working, of course, cross-partisan across the state, so as time goes on, will we get more pressure uh, for both the state level and the federal le level to, to, uh, to have them respond in a better way? But when you hear that right off the bat out of their mouths, um, what would be the best response to that? No, it's a great question. As you said, things are just so partisan now. We're actually about to run focus groups that may get you some answers next door to you in Wisconsin. Of course, that state, with all with the recall election, governor's election, Trump suddenly being competitive. Um, yeah, I had for the first time ever a pollster in Scott Walker's re-election, who I know from back in college, uh, actually told him, um, look, you can raise and spend another million. Uh, that will be the difference between winning 53-46 and 50. 54, 47, like literally 1% of the state was open to persuasion. And I've wow. never had a pollster tell a politician not to raise more money because it, it was done. Now, this was you know, an earlier election. Um, so you're right. It's hard to break through. And part of it, I mean, just putting so much front load effort to can you get a Republican on the bill, which I think was very helpful in New Mexico. And Steve had that mentioned that breakthrough he had. Um, and on the flip side, 
to be honest, if one of you's in, you know, in a red state that's overwhelmingly red, and you know, there may not be too many of them after this November. I think some are going to shift, but you know, in Alabama, we didn't want a Democrat, and we had plenty of Democrats who would have signed. If we were going to sneak this through, we actually did have to keep it clean because uh, Republican, because the state was so one-sided. But if you're in a state that's at all close, you know, you're not going to win. You know, if you're 52% Democrat, 40% Republican, there are going to be a couple Democrats who have a reason they don't want to be on this, just like if the Republicans have a narrow majority. So I would put as much effort as you can into getting a co-sponsor right at the outset who is from the other party, unless your state is really unbalanced. And most most sessions, for those of you who aren't one of these states, you know, are ending soon or have ended, so we're really talking about next year now. Um, now's the time to do it. Try to find, you know, lay the groundwork now to know which legislators you think can go out from the other party. So that first meeting is with them even before there's a bill to say, hey, would you co-sponsor if we did something like this and put a couple together? And I'm good. happy yeah. to work with – I mean, I think we all are happy to sort of work with you in order to uh, address – you know, what the language is, I can tell you there are, you know, sub-religions that are forming on uh, the Republican side against Citizens United being reversed. So if you ask for that, you're pushing a button that people are ascribing to in such a way that it's really not rational anymore. So I don't know what the language is that you're using, but that now has been dubbed as a um, right versus left battle of reversing Citizens United. And you don't have to say that. You don't have to mention that case. In fact, it's probably problematic to do so in practical future application. But those kinds of things I think are helpful the other deal, what we really found both here in New Hampshire and certainly in Alabama with all of the contacts that John has, and that is people who have been working there for a long time are exceedingly helpful in bringing that coalition uh, together as you head toward the starting line even, get you closer to the finish line. And that's we worked in Sherburn County here, and they just passed the resolution. And it, it, I was surprised they didn't have any if you, issue with the line, corporations are not people. Um, but they were concerned more with transparency and actually added some verbiage in there to make sure it was, was covered adequately. And being the most conservative county in the state, I thought that was a good place for us to start because then other counties will fall, fall into place. So hopefully, constituent-wise, we'll be able to put enough pressure on them. But the uh, state senator from that area is the committee head where the resolution sits in the state government. So, um, yeah, I'm seeing, you know, uh, the people are, I think probably will, will come up and speak, but, um, you're right. That's, that's, uh, that's good to keep in mind. Um, we don't say citizens United when we talk to the legislators, but, um, it was just interesting to see their response. So I think we'll do, yeah, we'll just keep working and, and hopefully over the summer we can make enough progress and we'll have a Republican we can get on the, on board at the beginning of the next session. So thank you both Great. very well, much. Thank, thank, thank you, Vicki, and uh, and we hope this report that uh, John and Steve uh, and all of us at American Promise are happy to release will help you communicate that this isn't just a Democratic thing, but a Republican thing and an independent thing and an American thing. So with that, let me uh, bring in Waboy Gatheru, our uh, other citizen empowerment coordinator and uh, Steve and John, thank you again so much for your leadership. We look forward to taking this across the finish line with all of you. But boy, take it away. Hi everybody. Thank you, Jeff. And as always, it's always exciting to be here. Um, and before we get to our grassroots victory, I want to start with some actions taken recently. So last year, APA members had 17 meetings with their elected officials or staff. And so far this year, APA members have had 17 meetings. Um, so our goal for 2018 is 100 meetings, and I know that we're absolutely going to smash that goal um, for once because of our um, National Citizen Leader Conference uh, Lobby Day in D.C. this June. So there were 26 media pieces published last year, and so far there have been 15 media pieces published, and our goal is to have 106 media pieces published in 2018. 
All to say there's a growing number of people that are super passionate about fighting for a government that represents us, the people. And we're making incredible progress. And, of course, we want to know about your meaningful elected officials or candidates or any media pieces that you have published so that we can include them in our next month's total. So if you've had any of these things, please send me an email at w-a-m-b-u-i-g at americanpromise.net. Um, the growth that we're seeing in these numbers is super exciting and indicative of the more and more people stepping up and getting involved to get big money out of politics. I want, and now I'm going to pass it over to Chip Cooper, who is an incredible citizen leader from St. Louis, Missouri, who I was thrilled to see this past week at our Riding the 28th Amendment event. Chip, along with other incredible citizen leaders of the St. Louis APA, were able to organize this event where 200 fired-up Missourians of all political backgrounds came together to talk about the amendment. Hey, Chip. Uh, how are you? Good morning. Uh, Good. Good afternoon, I guess. Um, okay, so uh, my assignment is to provide about a three-minute kind of profile of myself and our work in St. Louis and Missouri, right? You got it, Chip. Excited to hear from you. Okay. All right. So um, hello to uh, my fellow AP uh, associates. Um, as I said, my name is Chip Cooper. Um, I've been politically active my whole life, and I worked uh, for the Republican Party itself at one time and uh, in leadership roles for Republican governors for, uh, for many years uh, here in Missouri. I, I have not been uh, active uh, in, in the Republican Party for a while and have um, um, focused most of my time on local issues uh, in Columbia, Missouri, where I live, which is a, a nonpartisan uh, kind of a setup. Um, I will tell you I'm 65. We've just had our first grandchild, Sylvie, and, uh, and that is the person that I like to think about um, most of the time when I think about uh, what I'm spending my time on. So I was born in 1952 uh, into a Republican family, and believe it or not, my parents were school teachers. And uh, in, in brief, um, we believed in equal rights, clean water and air, a, a balanced budget, except uh, in emergencies, uh, despised uh, saddling future generations with debt, had faith in free enterprise, limited regulation. Uh, we believed that education, innovation, entrepreneurship, small business were the engines of America's economic success. success. We s were supportive of efforts to level the playing field, particularly for young people, um, all young people, to um, provide pe uh, kids uh, with legitimate opportunities to climb the economic ladder uh, if they were so inclined. Um, we believed in um, looking first to the private sector for solutions to um, social and economic problems, but we understood that government uh, also played an important role, had an important role to, uh, to play. Uh, believe it or not, we appreciated the loyal opposition uh, as a, a force to yield uh, the best ideas in our democracy, and uh, we believed that no person was above the law. That's kind of how I was raised, and I, that's pretty much kind of where I still am. But, um, you know, what I see now is that we uh, are living in a what to me looks like a corrupt and toxic uh, plutocracy, and perhaps it's even an oligarchy, but um, it seems that the, that the process seems driven by massive flows of uh, money uh, from the most uh, well-heeled special interests. So now... Surprisingly, after I retired, I, I now face what unexpectedly was uh, I see as the most important work that I've ever done. And so we, we in St. Louis, uh, the American Promise Group, believe the flow of money into politics is, is literally a cancer uh, that will generate a rather unending assault on democracy and, and the rule of law as we've uh, come to, to see it. Uh, we are definitely not okay with that. And so we um, pulled a group together in November uh, after uh, deciding that we had to um, focus on that cancer. We knew that would be a heavy lift and a, a long-term project. 
but we knew we had to uh, get at the underlying uh, pathology. So we started looking at groups um, involved in campaign finance, found uh, American Promise, uh, thought it was a great fit. And so uh, our group uh, in St. Louis is uh, all in, as, as you might uh, put it. Uh, since November, we've been um, busy um, getting organized, and, uh, and uh, the best way to get organized is to do stuff. Um, I think, as Steve said, uh, um, do some, doing something. So uh, uh, the first major thing we did uh, was hosted the uh, second Writing the 28th Amendment uh, Town Hall meeting. The first one was in Boston uh, uh, two or three weeks ago. Our meeting was last uh, Tuesday of this past week. And I assume that uh, most of you will be involved uh, in, in, in this kind of thing, these town hall meetings in the months ahead. Uh, in short, we work really hard. Uh, and I've done this kind of thing many times in my life. This was, this was a lot of work. Uh, and uh, our goal was to get out a big crowd and generate some uh, good media coverage, both uh, which are not always, uh, uh, those are not easy things to do. Um, and we were fortunate, got them both done, and had a, a rousing and uplifting uh, experience. It's very um, reassuring. And so today, I suppose that... Um, I would uh, pass on to all of you as, as you get your turn uh, to do the uh, writing the 28th Amendment town hall meeting, and I think we'll end up in all 50 states, that we would challenge uh, everyone to try to do better than we did and uh, surpass our turnout, surpass our coverage. And uh, we're really anxious to share uh, the experience that we had. It's very grassrootsy, very you know, hand-to-hand -hand type combat. And um, we did our best uh, to uh, try to outdo the Boston uh, meeting and to begin to build uh, um, uh, momentum and to create a wave uh, that we hope will grow larger uh, in the 18 months ahead as the, as the tour continues. And uh, when the 50th town hall uh, meeting takes place, uh, we hope that you'll need a much larger venue uh, than we did. Um, so think big. Uh, the fine, To close, I would say that one of the other things that uh, we do is we, we talk to elected officials and candidates as often as we can. We encourage them to take the uh, American Promise Pledge. And we were successful, and it was uh, uh, remarkably um, easy. Um, to get the uh, St. Louis Board of Aldermen uh, to adopt the American Promise Resolution uh, calling on Congress to send the 28th Amendment to the states. And um, I will also say that uh, as we get out and talk uh, to people that I, I, I'm rather uh, surprised, pleasantly surprised at how broad the support is for this and that uh, it would seem that most people feel the system is rigged and they want to unrig the system and they want to get big money out of politics. And, for, you know, I think all they need is a chance uh, to, to pull the voting lever uh, to get it done. And so hopefully we're going to give them that chance. And uh, so good luck to all of us and uh, let us in St. Louis know if we can help you. Thank you so much, Chip, and congratulations again to you and your team for um, excellent, excellent work. And if there's anybody on the call who is not yet in an APA and wants to learn about more about starting one, please send me an email at wambuig at americanpromise.net. So our action this month is focused on building cross-partisan support on the issue of money and politics. We will write letters to the editor that highlight the cross-partisan support at the state and local level on the need for a 28th Amendment. Remember, 8 out of 10 Americans of all political backgrounds agree that money plays too big of a role in our political system. The 28th Amendment is the vehicle to achieve this vision in creating cross-partisan support, in, which is critical to our success. And your letter to the editor um, should be really focused on thawing the resignation that we often talk about um, that is tied to divisive partisanship. Um, and this resignation is um, when people believe that there's not m much that they can do to fix the growing problem of money in politics. 
So using the newly released Government of Citizens Not Money report, co-authored by John Pudner and Steve Lipscomb, who we just heard from, um, to inform and shape your letter, it's going to be super duper powerful um, once you bring in that cross-partisan support. I'm now going to bring it over to Azer, who's going to lead our laser talk on the Government of Citizens report. Thanks, Azer. Yeah, thank you, Aboya. And, and just a heads up for folks, I think we're probably going to go o over the, the normal end time by just a couple minutes. So sorry about that, and, and no worries if you have to hop off early. Um, but the laser talk that Waboy is talking about is included in the action sheet you received if you RSVP'd for the email. And here's how the training on it will work. Um, in a moment, I'll go over the talk and then come back to the beginning, take everyone off mute, and ask a series of questions and have you actually shout out the answers to see what you remember. And then I'll go through the talk again with the same questions and just have you think the answers that time. Um, after that, we would normally have you pair up and practice the talk with the partner and then have a brave volunteer come up to the front of the room to try the talk. But since we're not in a room together, we'll end the call and ask you to actually practice the talk with a partner in your room if you're together with your APA. So here's how it'll work. The first sentence of the laser talk is, in our politics, big donors are well represented. Most Americans are not. And I'll continue going through the talk and then go back to the beginning and ask questions like this with everyone off of mute. So I'm going to unmute everyone. If you think you're in a particularly loud space, just go ahead and press one on your keypad to unmute you. But we'll just practice one line really quickly um, and everyone is off of mute. So in our politics, big who are well represented? Go ahead, shout it out. Big donors. Yes, big donors are well represented. And most Americans are what? Oh my gosh, you've got a call full of geniuses. Yes, most Americans are not. So that's exactly how we'll do it. I'm going to read the talk quickly in full and then before we go back and just think the answers. But in our politics, big donors are well represented. Most Americans are not. A 28th Amendment will keep corporate, union, special interest, and foreign money out of our elections and return our government to the people. No one party has ever won a constitutional amendment alone. If we're serious about winning a 28th Amendment, we'll need cross-partisan support. There are more than 160 co-sponsors in Congress supporting resolutions overturning Citizens United, but only one is a Republican. A new report titled Government of Citizens, Not Money, shows that hundreds of Republican lawmakers around the country, both local office holders and state legislators, have either voted for 28th Amendment resolutions or voiced their support. We're committed to bringing local and state-level Republican support to the federal level. We're united in our determination to return government to the people and restrain the power and corruption of big money in politics. So let's try it together, and just as we practiced, go ahead and shout out the answer if you know it. I'm going to put everyone off of mute. And in our politics, big who are well represented? Donors. Yes, in our politics, big donors are well represented. Most Americans are what? Not. You got it. A what will keep corporate union, special interest, and foreign money out of our elections? Yes, the 28th Amendment will keep corporate, union, special interests, and foreign money out of our elections and return our government to the who? The people. The people. Right, to the people. No one party has ever won a constitutional what alone? Yes. No one party has ever won a constitutional amendment alone. And if we're serious about winning the 28th Amendment, we'll need what? Cross-partisan support. Money. Yes, exactly. We'll need cross-partisan support. There are how many co-sponsors in Congress supporting resolutions overturning Citizens United? Oh my gosh, either you guys all have incredible memories or, or some of you might have it in front of you. I don't know. <laughs> right now there are 160, that's right, co-sponsors in Congress supporting resolutions overturning Citizens United, but only one is a what? Republican. Republican. Right. And in this new report titled What? shows that hundreds of Republican lawmakers around the country... 
government of citizens, not money. Yes, a, a new report titled <laughs> Government of Citizens, Not Money shows that hundreds of Republican lawmakers around the country, both locus office, local office holders and state legislators, have either voted for a what resolution? 28th Amendment. Yes, have either voted for a 28th Amendment resolution or voiced their support. We're committed to bring local and state-level Republican support to the what level? The federal, federal. Uh, federal level. That's federal. right, to the federal level. And we're united in our determination to return government to the what? People. Oh, people. people. Yes, government to the people and restrain power and corruption of what? Big, Big money, money. Big Big money, money. Big money and Right. We are united in our determination to return government to the people and restrain power and corruption of big money in politics. Thank you guys so much. That was that was fantastic. And we're going to do it just one more time. But this time we're not going to shout it out. We're just going to think the answers. Um, and, and again, I know it's two. So if anyone has to hop off early, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. In our politics, big who are well represented? That's right. That's right. Big donors are well represented. Most Americans are what? Most Americans are not. A what amendment will keep corporate unions, special interests, and foreign money out of our elections and return our government to the who? That's right. A 28th amendment will return our government to the people. No one party has ever won a what alone? That's right. A constitutional amendment alone. And if we're serious about winning a 28th Amendment, we'll need what kind of support? And again, just think it. That's right. We'll need cross-partisan support. There are more than how many co-sponsors in Congress supporting resolutions overturning Citizens United? 160 members in, co in Congress co-sponsoring resolutions, but only one is a what? Is a Republican. And, you know, I'm just thinking of the information we just learned on this call you know, that we should be changing this to there are only 160 members of co Congress supporting resolutions to get big money out of politics or to end legalized corruption. That, that Citizens United has become sort of a partisan buzzword, but I'm just going to move on. Um, a new report titled what? Shows that hundreds of Repub Republican lawmakers around the country, both local, local office holders and state legislators, have, have either whetted for a 28th Amendment, <laughs> a new report titled Government of Citizens, Not Money, shows that hundreds of Republican lawmakers around the country, both local office holders and state legislators, have either voted for the 28th Amendment resolutions or voiced their support. We're committed to bring what level Republican support to the what level? That's right, local and state level Republican support to the federal level. And last sentence, we are united in our determination to return government to the who and restrain power and corruption of what? Yes, we are united in our determination to return government to the people and restrain the power and corruption of big money in politics. That's the talk, you guys, and it's about 2.03 here on the East Coast, so thank you if you stayed the extra few minutes. And if you're with your group members when we hang up, go ahead and pair up and practice the laser talk. Try to do it from memory parts of it if you can while it's still fresh. And everyone have a phenomenal weekend. I'm going to take everyone off mute again um, so we can say bye. Bye, everyone. Have a fantastic weekend. Bye. 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 Thank, thank, bye. Thanks for doing that laser talk. That was a lot of fun. That was fun. <laughs> All right. Now, everyone, go tell that to 100 people today. I'm going to go do it. All right. Thanks, you guys. Talk, talk to you next month, if not sooner.